Earlier this month, I sent a newsletter to my audience with the subject line, Ask Me a Question. Basically, I told everyone to jump in the comments section of the post and ask me any questions they have about the media industry or creator economy. Several of you did pipe in with questions, and so I spent a few hours jotting down notes and then recorded this episode you're about to consume. I answered questions on a range of topics, like the difference between a creator-led company and traditional media outlet, non-traditional media business models, my advice on launching a media business in 2024, and how long it takes to build a media business from scratch. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. If you want to listen to an audio version of this show, subscribe to The Business of Content wherever you get your podcasts. This Q&A episode is actually part of an ongoing series. Every single month, I'll allow my subscribers to submit questions, and I'm going to do my very best to answer at least one question from every single subscriber. The only way to submit questions is by becoming a paid subscriber to my Substack newsletter. Subscribers also receive a Calendly link from me that allows them to book a half-hour introductory phone call. Many of my subscribers use it as an opportunity to tell me about their own media businesses and pick my brain on strategy. To subscribe, go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, let's jump into answering your questions. So our first question comes from Margie Whiteleather. She writes, Simon, thanks for everything you do. Here's a question. What can we learn from the business models of people or organizations that are not journalism or media, but which use some of the same strategies and create similar products, such as nonprofits, causes, consumer advocacy orgs, think tanks, and others. I actually want to start maybe by turning this question on its, on its head and suggest that it's really the other way around, that a lot of these non-media organizations could learn from media companies. One thing that like consistently astonishes me is how much money is wasted on traditional marketing avenues, traditional advertising, things like hiring PR firms. Like I actually come originally, like I was in traditional media, but I did work in the PR world for a while. So I kind of have firsthand experience with this. And I know that like to hire a PR firm for your business, you're paying a minimum of like $5,000 a month retainer. Um, a lot of firms won't even take a phone call unless you're paying upwards of twenty to $30,000 a month. And I think like the vast majority of brands that aren't like Fortune 100 companies are just like getting totally ripped off by this. Like what's going to happen when you hire a PR agency is they're going to just basically they're going to go to some PR database and pull down a huge list of reporters and then shotgun press releases and pitches out to all of them. And, you know, maybe they'll get a bite here or there and they'll be able to get you interviewed for some kind of trend piece or story. But I think like a lot of brands like vastly overestimate like the value of that to their to their company and their business. Like you getting interviewed by like even the something big like the Wall Street Journal, like, yeah, that's that's really cool to see your by or see your name mentioned in a Wall Street Journal article, but like what that actually does for your business is probably completely negligible. And it's certainly not worth kind of like these huge retainers that you have to pay in order to like constantly be pitching reporters uh, to get in these stories. And I also think like most me- most companies don't produce an actual un- enough newsworthy content or sorry, they don't produce enough news or product announcements or product updates or anything like that a reporter would actually care about. So like putting someone on a retainer to like just spend every day just pitching reporters when when there's you 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 don't really you're not really doing anything that's going to interest reporters. I just think like that they just burn so much money that's just unnecessary. And the same thing with advertising. Like you see so much wasted advertising dollars going towards like programmatic display ads and you know really they should be thinking more like media companies like taking all that all those resources like if i were if i had some kind of consumer product company or a think tank or a nonprofit i think all almost all my marketing budget would be going towards like hiring professional content creators like you know maybe on a freelance basis and just trying to put out like really high quality content so that you you know you could attract your own audience own your own audience capture that audience like i would rather have you know 10,000 
visits to a blog post on my company blog or 10,000 views of a YouTube video that my company created versus over a million impressions for, you know, like some disp- some ephemeral display ad that's that's appearing uh, on some website. So I, I guess to sum it up is I think like more companies, more organizations, more nonprofits, more think tanks, they should think more like media companies and, and creating editorial content versus, you know, spending all that money on like PR and, and traditional marketing. You know, I think one thing that organization, media organizations can learn from the nonprofit world is this is especially true for either nonprofit media organizations or like ind- independent publishers, people like me or who have like or someone who has like a very small staff is like, you know, nonprofits have really perfected the art of what I call guilt messaging to get people uh, to open their wallets and subscribe. I think there's this mistaken belief that the reason that people are motivated to subscribe to your outlet is because they want access to whatever perks you you have and sure that's a that's a part of it but really when you when you're a small independent business whether you're like a, a local news publication or a youtuber or a podcast or a newsletter creator i think like the main the biggest motivation that people subscribe that they subscribe to your outlet is because they want to support you like i think this is even true for my own subscribers it's like yeah they take advantage of the perks sometimes they schedule the phone call with me they submit questions to you know the series like this but in reality they just enjoy the content that, that i put out they enjoy my newsletter they enjoy my podcast and they want to support what i'm doing and and i don't think enough media organizations like lean into you know, asking for that support. And I think that's something they could learn, you know, from the nonprofit world. As for larger media organizations, I don't think this guilt messaging uh, would really work uh, because like people aren't going to be motivated to support some like, you know, large faceless media uh, conglomerate. Um, I think there's a little bit of this, like, you know, I think Washington Post and New York Times benefited a lot when, you know, Donald Trump was elected and there was all this like furor over like you need to, if you, if you want to have good information, you need to actually support media. And so there was a huge bump in subscribers as a result of that is because it made people feel good to subscribe to a newspaper. But for the most part, I don't think people are subscribing to larger media outlets for because it makes them feel good about themselves. And so that's why I'm skeptical when some for-profit large media companies engage in this kind of donation model. Like for instance, Vox.com, which is owned by Vox Media, which is a huge VC funded, you know, media holding company, they've been trying to use guilt messaging at the lar- at the end of their articles to try to get people to become contributors, even though they don't get any paid content as a result. And I'm just hugely skeptical that that's going to work, that people are going to be moved to some more support a publication just so that they can increase the value for, you know, the rich investors uh, and give them a good exit whenever, you know, Vox Media goes public or sells to a larger media company. You know, if if there's anything that media companies should be looking for towards in terms of copying, it should be like, you know, traditional product companies, like and because they should be thinking outside the box of, you know, getting outside of these like traditional media business models like subscriptions and advertising and thinking, you know, like, you know, how can we collaborate with product makers, consumer goods? How can we launch our own consumer goods Uh, and basically take that owned audience and figure out ways to get you know, that audience to purchase other things. Obviously, some big examples of that that I like to cite a lot is like Mr. Beast, the YouTuber. He launched a chocolate brand called Feastables. There's Logan Paul and um, KSI who have launched Prime, which is a kind of like a sports drink, a competitor to Gatorade. But even you see this at the smaller, small, smaller outlet level. There was this media entrepreneur I interviewed a few months back for my podcast his name's Dylan Bowman he runs or he he runs a media outlet called Free Trail which uh, focuses on the trail running community and he's like been getting a lot more serious about developing actual consumer goods products collaborating with brands 
who kind of are already understand like the supply chain and distribution mechanisms and like tying that to his media brand and using that as a marketing vehicle. So I definitely think in terms of like where media companies should, should be inspired or should look to, it should be models like that where they're, they're trying to, to maybe launch some non-traditional media products. Thanks for that question. The next question is from Joe Polizzi. Hi, Simon. I'm curious about how you see a difference between a media company and a content entrepreneur, aka a full-time creator. Is it a positioning aspect or human resources issue? From a business model standpoint, they are the same, but it seems you look at them differently. Thanks for all you do. Uh, So first I should note is that Joe Polizzi is a friend of the show. Um, he currently runs a conference called CEX. I think it's the Content, Content Entrepreneur Expo. Uh, he does it every year. I've been to one previously. It was a lot of fun. Uh, there's one upcoming in Cleveland this year, and I'm actually a speaker there, so I'm super excited to go and network. So if any of you are planning to go to CEX this year, definitely reach out to me by email. I'd love to you know, grab lunch, grab dinner, grab drinks. I'd love to, you know, I always like to get out and meet my audience. So definitely reach out and I encourage you to, to go to CEX because it's a great conference. So to answer your question, I don't necessarily think that the creator economy and traditional media are always mutually exclusive. And I kind of think of the creator economy as kind of like a, a subgroup with underneath the larger umbrella of media. But but I think sometimes the lines are blurred where sometimes something could maybe sort of be a creator economy type outlet and some, or it could also be considered a traditional media outlet. Like for instance, let's say three journalists kind of team up and they launch their own Substack newsletter. Are they, you know, are they creators or is that just another traditional media outlet? I guess if I had to define like what is the difference between like a creator and a traditional media company, it's that like the business is built for for a creator, it's built around a single personality or a small number of personalities. It's very kind of personality led, whereas with like a traditional media company, the brand of the company kind of supersedes or takes precedence over the individual content creators that work at it. So like even something like Mr. Beast, which, you know, is a huge YouTuber and he has hundreds of employees, I would still consider him as part of the creator economy because like it's all, everything leads back to his personal brand. Every every single video features him. Uh, You know, Mr. Beast is his, Jimmy Donaldson's personal brand. And so therefore, even though he has the structure of a traditional media company, uh, he I still would consider him like a member of the creator economy. I do think it's possible for like a creator company to kind of eventually mature and morph into a traditional media company. Um, basically, you know, if it starts kind of like personality led, but then the personality kind of takes like a backseat and starts hiring other content creators and tries to basically mimic a traditional media company. You know, a good example of this is like the Ankler, which is like a Hollywood Hollywood trade newsletter. It was started by a guy named Richard Rushfield, and it was largely built on his kind of personal brand and contacts. But within the last year or two, it took on a little bit of investment. It hired a traditional editor and is like basically hired out entire staff, has launched podcasts and stuff like that. Um, So it now kind of exists separately, you know, from Richard Rushfield's you know, personal brand, although he, his personal brand is still, you know, closely tied with it and associated with it. But, you know, theoretically, if there was some kind of exit, he could sell the Dankler to like a Penske Media or something like that, and then eventually step away and it would probably, you know, continue to grow and, and thrive and everything like that. You know, exa- another example is Barry Weiss, you know, she's kind of like a um, centrist, like heterodox writer um, who was at the New York Times, quit, resigned from the New York Times and launched a Substack newsletter, which was tremendously successful, but it was built around her personal brand. Uh, And then a few years ago, she pivoted uh, to launching something. She basically rebranded it and called it the free press. And now it's, it resembles a much more traditional media company. Um, And, you you know, publishes a lot more content that doesn't have her byline. So I do think that the lines are blurred and they're going to get blurrier 
uh, uh, as the creator economy matures. And a lot of these creator, creator economy startups today, these media startups, are going to look a lot more like traditional media companies like five or six years down the line once they want to get more serious about building the larger brand and then possibly having an exit someday. The next question is from David Ramos. Aside from ads and direct memberships, what are the monetization strategies you think will gain steam in 2024? I guess there would be like three business models that I see as kind of emerging and and, uh, I'm seeing like more and more media companies test the waters with them as we head into the new year. One is I'm seeing more creators and bootstrap media companies launching data products. So like, obviously, I think the most famous data pro- and most successful data product is the Bloomberg Terminal, you know, started by Mike Bloomberg in the 80s, costs, I think, around $23,000 a year. It's used by everybody who works on Wall Street. It's a great premium product. And it's great because it's like differentiated from editorial content, which I think, you know, obviously is somewhat devalued in the public eye because so much of it is free. So, you know, when people subscribe to something, they want to feel like they're getting something different, something exclusive and, you know, a data product that allows them to toggle through and look at different information that's, you know, exclusive can can provide that level of differentiation that can cause someone to subscribe and perhaps pay more than they usually would for a traditional content operation. You know, I've interviewed and talked to lots of media entrepreneurs who are doing this. Like, I think the reason why they're starting to come in vogue is the tools are there now to where you can collect this data a little bit more easily and format it and, you know, basically put it in a format where, um, you know, logged in subscribers can access it. And so maybe that's why we're starting to see it a little bit more. But also I think like create that a lot of media entrepreneurs are just trying to think about how they can truly differentiate their editorial, pro- their information products from what everybody else uh, is doing. And I think this is a good way. So like one person I talked to in 2023, his, his name was Simon Carlos. He was a kind of, he was publishing a, a newsletter about game discovery and marketings of games. And he was basically pulling all this information from publicly available platforms about how successful certain games were, like, you know, in terms of like downloads on stream and within the app store. And he was, because he was always like browsing and pulling this information anyway, he decided to basically begin collecting it and, and, uh, within, you know, maybe some Excel, Excel spreadsheets at first. And he basically built out a, uh, you know, hired coders and built out a data product that he sells to um, premium subscribers. And, and I think he, you know, also, you know, employees like the imp- people for just basic data entry now. And so that's kind of, you know, he's been able to differentiate himself as a result of that. I know Alexis Grant, she runs a, a cool publication called They Got Acquired, which focuses on um, small to medium sized businesses that have been that, that have had successful exits and been acquired by other individuals and companies. She's compiling a, a data product that basically compares, you know, where you can you can search through and see which companies have been purchased, who were they purchased for, what categories they're in, how much they were, stuff like that. And you could see how someone who is looking to sell their own company would appreciate a product like that where they can they can kind of do different queries and kind of hone in on what worked for other companies so that they can copy that uh, as they, you know, move towards their own exit. Um, I think online courses, I mean, they've been kind of in vogue for a few years, but I'm seeing more and more media companies um, focus on that. I think a lot of media entrepreneurs like the fact that it's not a hamster wheel, that you can create like a course that's basically evergreen content and sell it at a premium versus a subscription where you're you're constantly having to churn out new content. You're constantly having to deal with things like churn. I think there's um, something attractive about just, just creating a great, product and just focusing on selling it versus like constantly trying to appease ongoing um, subscribers. So I, I think there's uh, there, there's going to be a lot more investment in courses from media entrepreneurs going forward. And then I think there's going to be like a lot more kind of brand collaborations between media companies uh, and like basically traditional brands. 
Um, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but like this guy named Dylan Bowman, he runs this outlet called Free Trail and they do some of their own fitness apparel where they put Free Trail, um, you know, the logo on shirts and stuff like that. But then, the, but they also have, you know, sponsors like, like fitness apparel companies that they've worked with in the past where they're actually working hand in hand with those with those brands to design like their own kind of custom fitness apparel and they're selling like a co-branded product to their audience. So I think uh, we're seeing a lot of that now. Uh, We've seen Buzzfeed do this a little bit as well, where they're, they're actually working, they're actually collaborating during the product development. Um, And so I think that's a neat opportunity going forward. The next question is from Stephen Harrison. In 2024, how do you think about the balance between writing freelance for other publications, for example, newspapers, versus maintaining a newsletter for subscribers? Should a writer go all in with one or the other? I actually think both can be beneficial to the other, and you don't necessarily have to go all in on your newsletter business while you're trying to run a freelance business. I guess the the one caveat that I have to start with is like in order for them to, you know, have synergy with uh, with each other, they you, your newsletter has to be within a similar beat to what your, you know, freelance content is. Like if you're if during your day job you're freelancing about, you know, enterprise tech or something like that, but then your newsletter is about reviewing music albums, obviously there's not going to be much benefit beneficial cross promotion or or cross synergy between the two but if you're launching a newsletter that's aligned with your regular beat i think that your freelance career can benefit the newsletter and vice versa i think a good example of this is this guy named jr raphael he he runs this really successful newsletter called android intelligence and you know for the past i think 23 years or so he's been uh, a tech freelancer. I don't think he's ever had like a full time job, like salaried position within within the media. Like he's always been a freelancer, and he he wrote about tech for various various mainstream publications. And uh, like a decade ago, um, back when Android was still like this kind of small, tiny product that was far, you know, outshined by you know, the iPhone, he, he grew like a real interest in it. And he pitched to his editors uh, to have like a basically a, a regular column about Android. And he, he called that c- column Android intelligence. And so he would basically write it every week. And then a few years ago, he would always have like extra stuff that he wanted to write about that couldn't make it into the content. So he launched a newsletter, kind of like a supplementary newsletter uh, that was on the same subject and his editors were gracious enough to let him, you know, at the end of his column, plug that newsletter every single week where, so that, you know, people who were reading that article or column and they, and they got to the end, a lot of them would click through and sign up for the newsletter. And basically over a period of years, the newsletter started gaining way more traction. Um, He got, uh, he, he turned on paid subscriptions and started offering, you know, all kinds of benefits. And eventually, like the business of the newsletter grew to be larger than his business for his freelancer career. And he still freelances still today, but he, but he's dialed that back a lot. He's focusing more on the newsletter business and he's able to be more picky about what he writes for his freelance clients. And he keeps most of his content for the newsletter. So you could see how he, he kind of like, he kind of dipped his toe in the waters and worked his way up um, to owning more and more of his audience. And I think, you know, I think, you know, going forward, a lot of professional freelancers will follow a similar route. The next question came from an anonymous Substack user. How important do you think producing video and podcasts are to a primarily text-based business? I see major text-based creators like the New York Times' Jamel Bowie experimenting on TikTok, hear Bill Simmons flogging his YouTube channel on his podcast, and see IG's chief talk about how DMs are mostly people sharing reels and stories. The much broader version of this is, it seems like all these things are trying to find reach and provide public conversation post Twitter. Is that right? I I think a lot of people, if you ask them this question, would give you the advice to only focus on the mediums you actually care about. Like that if you, and, and I, I think this generally makes sense, that if like, if you really don't care about video at all, like forcing yourself 
to shoot TikTok videos, you know, every single day, it's it's you're not going to be good at it. You're not going to do a great job at it. You're also going to be take a, be taking time away from whatever you're, it is you're good at. In this case, maybe writing. And so, if there's absolutely no passion, no interest there. Um, and you have like limited time, like maybe this is a, you know, side hustle that you're doing during your full-time job, then absolutely, you know, you should be focusing what limited time you have on the medium that you're best at, that you're most passionate about, that you're, that you're excited about. That being said, I do think there's value in putting out content in multiple mediums. It like, it allows you to connect with different audiences in different ways, and reach them at different times. Like someone who reads something is doing that at a different time that they might be, you know, sitting back and watching a YouTube video. And it's definitely a different time than they would be listening to a podcast, which tends to be, you know, listened to while you're doing something else like driving a car or working out or cleaning and stuff like that. So, you know, creating things for different mediums is provides an opportunity to reach people at different times of their day and in different contexts. Um, And I think also like podcasts and video can be a way to create a stronger connection with your audience. I think there's something to be said about parasocial relationships and the intimacy of someone, you know, putting headphones in and listening to your voice. Um, You know, a lot of, you know, avid podcast listeners will talk about this effect of feeling like, you know, these people that you've never met are your close friends. And I I think that effect is real. And, And so you know, investing in podcasts or video, even though it's not your primary medium, can have downstream benefits that will help you uh, basically create habits with your audience. Um, This is why I've been, you know, planning in 2024 to double down on podcasts and video. In 2023, most months at most, I was putting out, you know, two podcasts per month. And now my goal going forward is to put out somewhere like two podcasts for week and I and per week. And so the kind of thinking there is that that will allow me to one kind of grow my audience because I think there is tremendous, you know, discoverability on platforms like YouTube from both, you know, the algorithm and then also search, but I also want to have that stronger connection with my audience and I think hopefully this will lead to higher conversions to things like subscriptions and advertising and stuff like that. Like, you know, I talk to a lot of people, a lot of people who read my newsletter, and I always find that like my biggest fans, even though my podcast audience is much smaller than my newsletter audience, I find that the people who listen to my podcast are, they're the ones who kind of geek out from talking to me because they've they've formed more of that parasocial relationship uh, with me. Uh, so... Yeah, I think it's a cool effect, and that's why I think it's sometimes worth investing in these mediums that you may not, you know, specialize in. Next question is from Jenna Spinelli. Uh, She is a Penn State journalism professor. She recently had me come speak to her class, so that was uh, fun and exciting. Uh, Here's our question. Many of the success stories you feature were projects that started during the pandemic when creators and media companies had a lot of time to create, audiences had a lot of time to consume, and a lot of people in media were forced to pivot quickly. How has the playbook for launching something new changed in the past year or two? What new techniques are people using to build their audiences that maybe didn't exist or weren't used as much in 2020 or 2021? It is true that a a surprising number of the successful media entrepreneurs that I interview for my podcast are like when I ask them when they started it, they almost always point to, you know, February or March 2020 is like their start date. Um, as you, as you mentioned, there was just like a lot of, you know, on the one hand you had a lot of creators with, or a lot of, um, aspiring creators with a lot of free time, either because they were furloughed from their jobs or just because they no longer had a commute or no longer had a boss looking over their shoulder that they had the free time to create content. And then, you know, you had a lot of consumers who were locked down at home who couldn't go out Uh, And so they just had a lot of free time to consume content. So certainly that is a phenomenon that I think is real. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the biggest media companies 10 to 20 years from now started out uh, during the pandemic. In terms of what's new, I think um, the environment is a lot 
more saturated now. I think it's a lot more competitive. I don't think you can just, I think it was easier back in 2017 or so for you to launch for like a journalist to announce they're leaving their job and launching a newsletter. And for that be enough of an anomaly that people will kind of rush their biggest fans would rush to become paid subscribers. But now, you know, the subscription space is so saturated uh, that it probably wouldn't even make much of a splash these days when a, when I, uh, you know, a creator is, you know, announcing they're going off on their, their own. So they have like much larger mountain to climb to kind of reach kind of critical mass of audience that they can start monetizing it properly. So in terms of like what advice I would give for someone who was just starting out today, maybe they have a little bit of an existing brand, but um, you know, they haven't started monetizing their audience directly and they're looking to is I think like the newest trend I'm seeing is, is creators teaming up, like recognizing that, you know, it's extremely hard. It requires a lot more runway to go off on your own and build an audience and build a business of scratch. And if you team up with other content creators, you know, the the you can generate content at a faster clip. You can grow much quicker. The sum is greater than its parts. Uh, and then you can also divide business functions uh, where, you know, someone might be more responsible for the marketing aspect of the business and someone else might be, you know, in charge of you might more comfortable with, you know, e cold emailing advertisers and stuff like that. So you can like divide and conquer and build a media, build an audience and build a monetization mechanism much more quickly if you team up. So if I were starting as a creator or media business today, I would maybe cast about for a business partner, look for other people kind of creating content in my niche, uh, someone who has their own brand and can bring their own skill set to the table, and then I would team up with them. And you're seeing a lot of cool kind of um, wider writer cooperatives and business partnerships start up today, like so many of the media entrepreneurs I'm interviewing for my podcast and my newsletter actually have co-founders who who help them along the way um so i think that's that's something i would do if i were starting out today next question is from andrew Curtin. hi simon thanks for everything you do i have a question around events both axios and semaphore kicked off their businesses with a huge emphasis on events during the initial years I'm wondering if these companies build out an events program for the year and then try to find sponsors, or do they build events in partnership with the sponsors themselves? Or basically, what he's asking is like, do they find a sponsor first and then work with the sponsor to uh, build an event about, around that sponsorships? So I guess I should first by issuing a caveat that I don't have any special knowledge of these two companies. Um, I've never worked with them. I haven't, uh, I have interviewed some people from Axios, but, uh, but I not about necessarily about their events, but I have worked with similar outlets in the past. And I've obviously interviewed a lot of media companies that have had success with, uh, with events. So I have some general understanding of, of how these work. I would say that in general, I think most publisher events are still editorial driven, meaning that they kind of come out with an event schedule or plan out an event and then they're trying to find sponsors some after the fact and maybe finding you know a lead sponsor for the event someone who like actually shows up on the program or, or something like that for the most part i think that's what's happening that being said I think sponsorship demand might determine whether an event actually happens or the number of events and stuff like that. I don't think I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of these publishers, especially that are running free events that are spawn that are entirely reliant on sponsorships, they're probably not going to be hosting a lot of events that don't have um, sponsors. So maybe there's like a tentative date for an event that they want to do and then they're looking for a sponsor. And if they don't find that sponsor, then they just never announce uh, that event. But I get why you're asking the question. I think there's a definite blurring of the lines between editorial content and sponsored content in the event space that you don't see you know, with traditional like online or print media outlets. Um, like with those kinds of media outlets, they would never let 
sponsors drive their editorial content like they might have native advertising and sponsored articles and stuff like that but that's clearly labeled that's something that's completely different it's not like they're creating a bunch of editorial content and saying and you know tugging on the sponsor and having the sponsor give input and stuff like that and presenting it as traditional editorial content that's that's supposed to you know be no different from the non-sponsored content but i think it's more acceptable in the event space from both attendees and event organizers for there to be this kind of blurring of the lines where maybe a sponsor is sitting on the stage with some other panelist or gets to make a small very small presentation or introduction at the at the beginning and or is is completely underwriting the entire thing and maybe all the 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 sponsor has is the only has the only panelist on the stage and i think there's a there's a little bit more willingness to engage with that type of content and not necessarily thinking thinking of it as purely sponsored that it has you know editorial value in the space the event space so i wouldn't be entirely surprised if even a traditional media company like semaphore would work in tandem with a sponsor to plan out an event um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And our final question comes from Simon Carlos, who I actually mentioned earlier uh, in this episode when I was talking about he's the he's the guy who um, who runs the gaming marketing uh, newsletter that built out a data product. He asked, "Do people underestimate the amount of time it takes to build up an audience from scratch for their media business, and how long does it take for it to be big enough?" In many cases. Yes, I totally I think they totally underestimate what it takes uh, to build kind of critical mass of an audience and start monetizing it. That's why there are so many abandoned YouTube channels, podcasts and newsletters. Uh, There's so many so many instances where they start producing content, they get discouraged, nobody's watching it, they're getting no feedback. Uh, and for, usually what happens is they start posting more infrequently and then it just kind of peters off and they stop completely. There are probably millions upon millions of abandoned blogs, newsletters, podcasts, YouTube videos, and it's all because of this problem. So what kind of runway do you need in order to gain that critical traction? That you, and, I, and I think of it as like, I, I use the word escape velocity, like that, like a media outlet has to get a certain amount of momentum where it's no longer producing one off hits. It's actually like each hit is driving success for the next piece of content. Um, so like I think I think a good rule of thumb is that if you're starting from scratch, you should pro- like especially if you don't have any existing brand, you have a small Twitter following or you know a small, a small email list or maybe no email list at all, that it should take at least six to 12 months of posting before you start even noticing momentum. That means that for the first six months, you should expect, to have almost no audience whatsoever. Like you're basically at that point, you're just putting in the reps. You're just try, you're just getting better at creating content. You're you're building a backlog of content so that when that audience eventually comes, they have kind of this archive that can help you in terms of building that momentum and and give them more like something to dive into so that they can, you know, form a better relationship with your brand. So I think you know, let's say you're a weekly newsletter, a weekly new, weekly YouTube channel, weekly podcast. I think you're looking at a minimum of six, 12, six to twelve months where you should prepare yourself to have very little uh, traction. And then I think at the end of that twelve month period, that's when you start seeing like an actual fan base, like not just drive by viewers or drive by readers, but like people who are making, starting to make a habit of reading or consuming your content. They're starting to share it with their peers or recommend it on social media. And then suddenly you're finding yourself tagged on LinkedIn or tagged on Twitter. And you're, you're starting to feel like, oh, I have an actual audience here that's like cares about what I'm doing. They actually know that like they're they actually know who I am. Like if they said if I said someone said my name, they'd be like, oh, that person creates that YouTube content or that's a newsletter that I read. So so 12 months before there's that basic brand recognition. Now, brand recognition is a lot is, is a far way off from actually having enough critical mass to build a build an actual business. Um, that's a whole different can of worms. You know, that's the question I ask a lot of my guests on my podcast. Like, how long 
were you producing content before you were generating a full what you would call a full time salary? And I think it can take. There's always outliers, but I think it can take years of publishing consistently before you can even hope to make a full time living at it. Um, and I just don't think the vast majority of aspiring media entrepreneurs are ready to to make that type of commitment. They don't have that kind of runway. Most of the successful creators, and I, I haven't gone back and officially tallied this up, but like based on like what my general feel is, is that the, the, the successful creators and media entrepreneurs I interview for my show, they took anywhere between, I would say, two to five years of consistent production um, before they made a, a full-time living. And I would say a lot of them err towards the five years versus um, the two years. So you're definitely, you definitely have to be in it for a long, long, for the long haul. It's going to take you upwards of a half decade or more. Uh, and yeah, I know that's might be discouraging to some, but I, I think it's actually, you know, encouraging because you realize that the, the key differentiator that makes you, that's your superpower is time and consistency. And if you can be consistency and, sh- and put in the reps and show up week after week, then you will have an advantage over, you know, 99% of other co- aspiring content creators out there. Okay, I think those were all uh, the questions. Uh, this is extremely weird. I, so I, I've had a, an interview podcast for going on several years, and I feel like I'm getting more natural at it. I'm asking better questions. I have fun doing it. But there's always another person to bounce that dialogue off of. And so speaking into a camera, speaking into a microphone for going on, what is it now, uh, you know, close to an hour, it's extremely weird to speak extemporaneously uh, like this. So uh, I apologize in advance if some of this came off as awkward. I think the more I do it, the better I'm going to, uh, the better I'm going to get at it. Um, so yeah, uh, um, I'm going to be sending out my next, ask me a question newsletter next next month in the beginning of February where my paid subscribers can submit their questions and I'm super excited about this series like I'm serious like I'm going to answer at least one question from everyone who submits one it might not be in the podcast it might be within the comments itself and there might be instances where you ask a question that I really don't know the answer to and I'll just be honest with you and say hey I, I'm not qualified to really answer this question, but you'll at least get some kind of response. And I'm, I really want to provide value to my subscribers through this series. So I'm super excited. So I hope when uh, next month's Ask Me a Question newsletter shows up in your inbox that you'll submit a question for me and a really good one. Um, all right, that's all I have for today. And uh, I'll see you in the next episode.